Hello, good people of the internet. John Perry here, and this is my Science vs. the Ark Encounter halftime special. So I've done three videos so far, and I've got at least three more to make. But before continuing and doing those, those videos, I wanted to just do a little bit of follow-up. One of my favorite podcasters is Darren Nash. He has a podcast called the Tet Zoo Podcast, which you should definitely be listening to if you are at all interested in evolution or tetrapod zoology. Darren is a paleontologist and he runs that podcast with artist John Conway. John Conway does paleo art for the most part. You know, every time they do a podcast, people will comment on it and sometimes people will be upset with some of the things that they said. And so they'll have a follow-up segment. They call it the FU segment. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do a little FU segment, a little follow-up segment here. And I also want to take a little bit of time to talk about Ken Ham and why it is that I think that he's doing the things that he does. So that's what I'm gonna do today. My first follow-up is, you know, one of the most common YouTube comments that I've been getting on this series is, why don't you make more of these, John? Why don't you hurry up and make more Science versus the Ark Encounter videos? We love them. And Thank you. I am flattered. It is a little bit slow making these videos, and the reason for that is that, you know, I was, I kind of have a soft spot for young earth creationists. I was raised with not full on young earth creationist beliefs, but heavily leaning towards young earth creationism. And I just, yeah, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of sensitive to the way in which people from that world might be interpreting this. I kind of torture myself trying to be as careful as I possibly can not to add insult to injury. For people who are receiving this type of knowledge about how evolution works and about how people like Ken Ham have been hiding certain things from them, that's a difficult thing to learn about and to hear about and to realize. And so I'm being very, very careful. And because of that, I, I double check, I triple check, I show these videos to other people and get their feedback. It's not an easy task to make these videos because of the, I guess, the sensitivities that I have towards towards my audience. But more videos are coming. Like I said, I've got three more to do and I'm very excited about them. One of those will be about Mars, the Mars exhibit at the Ark Encounter. Really excited about that one. Now, I have received a lot of angry comments on these videos and most of them, the things that they're angry about aren't really legitimate criticisms. They're upset because the knowledge that they're gaining from these videos is different than what they thought things were supposed to be. So a lot of those criticisms I'm not going to engage here in the follow-up video, but there were a lot of other criticisms that were legitimate, and I do want to talk about those. Probably the most common and the most legitimate criticism that I received in the comments was underneath video two, where I talked about Archaeopteryx, and I talked about these special types of fossil beds called Lagerstätten. Lagerstätten is a German word, and a lot of my German viewers were upset with my pronunciation. I was calling it Lagerstätten. It's Lagerstätten. More specifically, it's Lagerstätten. Lagerstätten. Now, most of the Germans who complained about this understood that Lagerstätten is now being used in English, and so the strange pronunciation of the S, they weren't expecting me to do, the Lagerstätten, but they were wanting me to do that last hard vowel correctly. I was saying Lagerstätten, and it's Lagerstätten. So I apologize for my error. <laughs> Please forgive me, Germany. Please forgive me. The second follow-up, the second F you, John, that I think I should probably actually talk about here, came from a guy who was very upset with me for the way that I portrayed the position of John Rubin. John Rubin is a paleontologist. He's one of two paleontologists that disagrees with the scientific consensus about the origin of birds. And the angry commenter, he said that the way that I portrayed John Rubin made it sound like John Rubin doesn't really believe his own hypothesis, but instead just felt like it was his scientific duty to butt heads with the scientific consensus, to challenge the scientific consensus. And I went back and watched the video and the commenter was right. The way that I had ended up cutting everything before posting, it did make it sound like John Rubin didn't actually believe in his own hypothesis. John Rubin does believe in his own hypothesis. He definitely believes that he is right and that all of the other scientists 
are wrong. For a little bit of clarification, I think it'd be good for me to overview real quickly what John Rubin's position is and what the scientific consensus is. Let me just start out with the scientific consensus. If you go back far enough in the fossil record, there are no dinosaurs, there are no crocodiles. Instead, there is a primitive group of what we call archosaurs. The consensus is that archosaurs split in two, and one of these groups ended up giving rise to crocodiles, the other group gave rise to dinosaurs. Then dinosaurs within the dinosaur clade, one group evolved into what we call theropod dinosaurs. These are the two-legged meat eaters, usually meat eaters. They're things like uh, T-Rex and Velociraptor. Those are the two really famous ones from that group. From within this small group of theropod dinosaurs, the scientific consensus is that birds evolved from that. And there's a lot of evidence to back that up. A lot, a lot of evidence. I went over some of that in video two. Here, John Rubin thinks that the consensus is a little bit confused. He accepts the idea that, yeah, if you go back far enough, there's, we've got archosaurs. But he thinks that before archosaurs gave rise to dinosaurs, there was another split. And that split, so again, this is before dinosaurs even exist yet, that little split, that branch of the archosaur tree that he proposes exists, he thinks that gave rise to birds. And he thinks that animals like Velociraptor are not really dinosaurs. He thinks that they are in this bird line. He, he thinks that T-Rex is a, is a real dinosaur. And, you know, most scientists would put T-Rex and Velociraptor as being fairly close relatives. They're both theropod dinosaurs. John Rubin, no. He believes that Velociraptor and what the rest of us are calling bird-like dinosaurs, he thinks those are archosaurs. They are not dinosaurs, that they split before dinosaurs even became a thing. And he believes that the similarities that we see between things like Velociraptor and T-Rex, he thinks that those are just a coincidence. That's John Rubin's position. I don't see a whole lot of evidence to support that. John Rubin believes that he will eventually have enough evidence to convince the world that he is correct and that everybody else is wrong. But he's not there yet. He hasn't been able to do that successfully. Uh, I've, I've seen his work, I've read his papers, and to me, I don't find them convincing, but that is his position. So there we have it. That, uh, that wraps up the follow-up, the F you, John, segment of today's video. Recently, I've been thinking a lot about the motives of young Earth creationists like Ken Ham. I've had a lot of people comment and say that they believe that Ken Ham is lying to people. And they believe that he is lying to people because he wants money. And he's found that being a young earth creationist and selling lies to young earth creationists is easy money. That these people are somehow really gullible and he's exploiting them. I do not think that that is the case. I do think that Ken Ham is deliberately misleading his own audience. And for those of you that are like shocked by that statement and you want evidence, go back and watch video three of Science versus the Ark Encounter. In that video, I go through and we look at one of the plaques at the Ark Encounter and we break it down claim by claim by claim. And we talk about the things that Ken Ham is doing there. Some of the claims that he makes are false. And if you say something that's false, it's quite possible that you're just confused, right? But Ken Ham also uses a lot of what we call half-truths, and they're extremely well-crafted half-truths. And if you're going to create a half-truth, you say something that is technically true but extremely misleading, in order to craft a really good half-truth, you have to understand what the full truth is, and then you have to deliberately craft that half-truth so that you can deliberately mislead your own audience. So Ken Ham is using tactics that I would say are definitely dishonest. You know, if you don't want to say that they're lies, flat out lies, they're, they're at least definitely dishonest. But why? What are his motives? As I mentioned, money has been suggested, and I think it's fair to say that Ken Ham is making a good living. I don't know what his personal finances are, but he is extremely good at raising money. He raised a lot of money to build the Ark Encounter, and I'm sure that he's kept a little chunk of that. But I don't think that the main purpose of Ken Ham's ministry is to make money and to exploit people to make money. To mislead and exploit your own audience for money, that really takes a special kind of monster. And I don't think Ken Ham is that kind of monster. He is being dishonest, but I think he's doing it for a very different reason. If you get on Ken Ham's website and you read about his beliefs, you will find that Ken Ham believes in a literal heaven and hell. He thinks that people will be consciously tortured or rewarded for eternity after they die. And he believes that the only way to go to heaven, 
to be rewarded versus tortured, is to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now, those two doctrines, I would say, are fairly common among Christians. A lot of Christians hold those beliefs to one degree or another. There are some Christian groups that aren't so sure about the hell part. The book of Revelations is where we really hear about the kind of torture and torment that goes on in hell. And the book of Revelations by some people, some Christian thinkers, is thought to be more, uh, more of an allegory than literal truth. But for the most part, I would say that most Christians believe in a heaven and hell, and most Christians believe that Jesus Christ is the way to go to heaven. But Ken Ham has an extra belief that helps justify being dishonest. And that is, he believes that the theory of evolution leads people away from Jesus. And he believes that the theory of evolution is false. He thinks that it's one of these scientific theories that will eventually get turned over with more evidence. So he believes it's false, and he believes it's currently having its, you know, day in the sun. It will someday be turned over, but he doesn't know how to turn it over himself. And so the next best thing that he can do is lie about it to stop people from being led away from Jesus. That might seem weird, like why would you lie? Why would you resort to lying? But if you if you take a more practical example, like let's just pretend for a moment that we are living in Nazi Germany. Lagerstätten. Lagerstätten. And you're a German, you're not keen on this whole Nazi thing, and you have some really good neighbors that you really care about who happen to be Jewish, and the Nazis are coming by your door and they're asking you where your Jewish neighbors are. You know where they are, but you don't want the Nazis to find out. I think that almost all of us, even those of us that really care about honesty, would say that it's okay to lie in this situation. When you look at Ken Ham's belief system, all of these beliefs together that I've listed off here, and by the way, the, the, the last two I kind of had to piece together from watching multiple talks of his. He does not have that explicitly written that I could find on his website. When we take all of these beliefs together as one, we realize that in Ken Ham's mind, there is good moral justification for lying to his own audience about the theory of evolution. He literally believes that he is saving people from an eternity of torment and torture in hell. He is not the amoral sociopath exploiting his audience for money like some people think that he is. Now, some of you might disagree with me. You, you might think that I'm way off the mark. But I find this way of thinking to be extremely enlightening. It helps tell us what we might be able to do to make teaching evolution easier. Ken Ham's not the only person that shares these, this special set of doctrines. There are a lot of Christians that are very disturbed by the theory of evolution. They really do think that it is going to lead them or their children away from Jesus Christ. And they think that, that they or their children will then burn in hell for time and all eternity. I mean, this is a, this fear is very real for the people that believe these things. And understanding that helps us understand what we can do as science educators to help people overcome this barrier. If you are a teacher and you notice that one of your students is having this issue, just let them know that according to official polls, there are hundreds of thousands of Christians out there that have found a way to accept the science of evolution while also maintaining their religious beliefs. For people that are very set in their ways, like Ken Ham, that information might not be very helpful, but for a student, that actually might be a really good piece of information. Anyway, those were my thoughts, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm just really happy to be able to get on here and do this little halftime special with you, do some follow-up, uh, tell you about these things I've been thinking about as far as Ken Ham goes and uh, the motives of creationism. If you have enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and click the little bell icon. That will make sure that you get to see the next Ark Encounter videos that I produce. So long for now. Stay curious. Lagerstätten. Lagerstätten 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 Lagerstätten, 